The following is a presentation of Hokopolitso with support from the Maryland Humanities Council. The Howard County Poetry and Literature Society presents The Writing Life. Colleen Owens, professor of English from George Mason University, talks with the distinguished writer Edna O'Brien. We're delighted to welcome to the studio today the distinguished Irish author, Edna O'Brien. Uh, Edna has been uh, a writer in, in the Irish scene for the past 30 years, having made a reputation for herself for her early works in Ireland and Britain, when indeed uh, she became not only a, an overnight success as an author, but also a, in time a very important figure in modern Irish culture and, and uh, times in the impact that her works had on, on the readership in Ireland and on the world at large, the image that, of Ireland that it gave. Uh, Edna is, is very significant then in understanding modern Ireland. And I'm delighted to talk to her today uh, to catch up on what's happened to her since those early days when she was a scandalous woman. <laughs> so welcome, Edna. Thank you, Colin. <laughs> a scandalous woman. I've never myself felt that. But uh, I called a story that, and it was really a story about a little girl observing an older woman and the romantic life, shall we say, of an older woman. But it's odd how the name stuck. When um, my books first came out, The Country Girls was the first, I had, to put it mildly, a rum time. Um, it, it was banned, but prior to the banning, um, the nuns from my convent in Loch Grey, the head nun, wrote to me and said, we have heard that you have written a novel. We give credence an open mind, but we fear. So I knew that wasn't an open mind. And then in um, my little village, uh, Tom Graney, three copies were bought, much to the chagrin or more than that of the parish priest, and they were don't die, it's so pathetic, but it's so funny. They were burnt in the grounds of the church, these three copies. Incredible. Some women are said to have fainted. Damn. Then it was also officially banned. There was no happiness for me in any of this. But the, the biggest, um, or the, the most hurtful blow, what does Shakespeare call it? The most unkindest cut of Incredible. all, yes. was um, my own family. Uh, they were very appalled. And in retrospect, I can understand it. There I was, one of their daughter. Didn't seem to be anything out of the ordinary. Not that I feel out of the ordinary, but God gave me a, a talent, and it's God I thank for it, not myself. Suddenly wrote this book, which to them seemed an utter disgrace. And they were very, um, Oh, they were awful about it, and so my mother said that somebody said to my father, the postmistress, Zor was the postmistress, she should be kicked naked through the town. Looking back on it, why naked? That in itself is it's very scandalous. Lot, yes. And I sent them the book, and I had um, written in handwriting, you know, to mom and dad with love, Edna. And years after, when my mother died, I found the country girls among some pillows and linen, and it was something I will never forget, and perhaps never forgive. She, she had inked out to Mam and Dad with love, Edna. But she had gone through the book, and you know, there's a character called Baba who is a bit bored and uses the odd word, swear word. She had inked out in thick, black, impenetrable ink every offending word. Yeah. And when I saw that, and I saw, I felt I myself was being mutilated. But with the benefit of life and psychoanalysis and reading, all of which I think is the education, the true education in this world, I, I, think, I think how awful it must have been for her, how truly ashamed and shocked and horrified she must have been. And Again, it's all to do with culture and education. Right. Right. It wouldn't happen now. There's television, there's talk of contraception, there's the word divorce is mentioned in Ireland, if it's, right. if it, even if it's not allowed. But it was, in its sense, the Dark Ages. 
Now, without, I, I also want to say there was a good side to that for me, which was I, I like raw, primitive material and raw, primitive feeling. It's the source of literature. So you have to, as they say, take the good with the bad. Right. Although I would have liked mm. a happier and indeed to have been accepted rather than, than, than uh, condemned and pilloried, mm. at the same time they gave me, both my individual parents and my country, this peculiar kind of highly strong, fervid, fervidness. Mm -hmm. And in a world now, like the modern world that we're all in, all that is gone. They, uh, well, not all mm. gone, but the world is computerized. You know, there's not much right. human story. Right. Language is vitiated. People more or less talk the same language. In Ireland, there's a great, great delight in language. And right. in a way, they don't ban books now. They don't even take them that seriously, I suppose. No. Uh, I'm, I suppose that uh, your own experience is something that is historically significant in that it is one of the one of those that broke the ice for for Ireland in your books yes. are, are a demarcation between the, the that low point in the 50s and the new Ireland that began to come out in the 60s. It took a little bit of time. It Colin. Did. But, <laughs> in but, but, uh, in, yes, I think so. Again, I wrote and always do write instinctively. I don't ever think who's going to like this book or uh, who's not going to like it. If I did, I'd, I'd be in hospital permanently. Mm. But I suppose it did, first of all, probably, because it was a female voice, and there had been mainly, you know, That's male right. writers, including the great ones, whom we'll come to in a minute. It was a female voice. It was from a, a small locality, therefore a very enclosed community. And in the character of Baba, for which I am ever grateful, I was able to make fun of certain uh, stringencies of the convent of the Catholic Church and so on. I have. To, may I tell you one little joke about the convent? Do please. Well, the book obviously got to the convent. Uh, no further letter. But uh, not so long ago, like last year, I was at Edinburgh Festival and I was signing some books after. And a girl said to me, "I went to Lochray Convent after you." And I said, "Ah," she said, "You know, we said the rosary for you every night of our lives." I said, "What good has it done me?" <laughs> oh <dear>. <laughs> <laughs> they kept it up, the vendetta. Were you surprised at that reaction, and how long it held on? I was actually. I shouldn't have been, but again, I, there there are certain things in this world I don't address myself to, mm. like. You know, I suppose I, I hope in that way one hopes within a fairy tale that all will be well. Mm -hmm. So I was surprised. I was also very stung by it and very hurt. And the reasons, well, the reasons are obvious, but there's a very central reason, which is that writing itself and writers by their nature have a deep, we wanted to think of Kafka, Joyce, anyone we love, have a deep insecurity. They have an authority when they write, but are often very disturbed creatures. And therefore, to be attacked, especially by your own, mm -hmm. you know, it's like Michael Collins, killed by his own. When you're attacked right. by your own, not even literary people, because, you, you know, that's normal. Mm -hmm. You're praised, you're not praised, you're this mm -hmm. and that by literary critics. But when you're attacked by your own and made to feel um, a sinner, uh, it, there was one phrase I'll never forget which said of the country girls and the trilogy, this smear on Irish womanhood. Yes. And what hurt me terribly was I feel things very s deeply and I'm only interested in feeling. And only people in the world that I love and like and the mm -hmm. only writers I love and like mm -hmm. are saturated with feeling. Right. That is what writing is about, rendered in language. Yeah. Constable said of his pictures, he said, I paint emotion. Well, yeah. I think what I want to do is to write emotion. Had I written a clever little book, do you know, or a funny little book, and they attacked me, but yes. I think um, it's a, uh, yes, it was savage. But of course, a writer of your, of your passion and a writer of your commitment, a writer of your, voca your vocation, 
has got to, to be independent of yes. what people think. You have to be, but it hurts. I'm sure it does. You'd be a, you, you know, you, I'd be a liar mm. if I... Mm. You have to be. And also, mm. I think you get confidence as you go along. Mm. Not about the writing itself. Each book is harder than the previous one, because you have to you scrape harder at you the psyche, you yeah. know. But you have... I have found mm. some wonderful friends who uh, and support over the years. And my publisher, for instance, Roger Strauss, who is a wonderful publisher, they're wonderful because they're glad when you deliver a book and they read it with great, you know, and that, that's a lot. I see, yes. That helps. And you have also enthusiastic readership in Ireland, do you not, today? I have. I, I have certainly enthusiastic readership in America, judging by last night, and um, in England. Yes. I have, I, I think in Ireland, one of the things makes me a little sad is I don't think they've read my more recent books. I think because the country girl has <laughs> yes, created yes. a star. But for instance, this book, Lantern Slides, a book, of my last book, which is a book of short stories. Um, I don't think they've read it very much. I don't know why. Well, it is certainly true that your reputation has enlarged in this country considerably over the past, what would it be, 10, 15 years, because you're appearing in the um, New Yorker. Yes, the New Yorker That's readership is amazing because it yes. goes throughout the country. And I get masses of letters from the New Yorker, you, you know, forwarded on. And I'm always surprised, genuinely, in a, because my world is a fairly um, limited world, in a sense. It's a, a lot of the stories are in Ireland, a nun in love with a g young girl, or vice versa, um, a, a party to which a girl goes to Irish revel she thinks she's going to a party, but she's uh, really only going to wash up. Yeah. And it's that little story that I was um, n nicely uh, accused, I think it was by William Trevor, of, of copying The End of the Dead, because you know in The End of the Dead and the snow is so falling party, softly yes. over. Mm. And um, in the end of this story, Irish Revel, it's not snow, but it's rain, and the narrator who has a bicycle, describes this rain falling on swamp, on gate posts, mm. and then her own house, like a little white box at the end of the world, waiting to receive her. Mm. It was almost like a coffin as well, as if yes. the house was a coffin. Yes. So that, yeah. to go back to having my readers here, right. or readers here, it's, it's wonderful that uh, that, that can be. Mm. That, you know, I, for instance, love Chekhov and reread Chekhov all the time. And of course, that is a totally other world. But I identify right. it, because I yes. identify with the pulse of emotion and right. story and longing. Longing is one of the things, I think, that's very central to my, uh, I think it's true of everyone. Mm -hmm. Well, I see indeed in your stories uh, from The New Yorker that you bring the, the combination of the passion and the vision of, of an Ireland that you knew as a child with a a very refined sense of te technical control that I think is so wonderful, like in Sister Imelda uh, and Mrs. Reinhardt. Many of these yeah. stories bring a, an extraordinary balance and judgment that I, I think is so effective and that I think the New Yorker readership appreciates. I wonder to the extent, to what extent do you think is your own, your own style affected by the fact that you're writing for the New Yorker rather than for the audience no, for which you wrote no. the earlier works. No, no it's not, no, doesn't work not like at that. All. In fact, they turn down stories as often. They no, do. No, it isn't. And, it, and, in, and I often have little, I'm having one present time, even as we speak. Unfortunately, they often want to remove the very thing that gives a story its buck, you know. Oh, it's, no, I couldn't write for the New Yorker. No insult. I'm delighted no. they published me. But no, because I couldn't write for any market. No. I can only write it, and that's hard yeah. enough, and rewrite it. But yeah. sometimes they take a story that surprises one, they take it, another one they reject. And I see. You know, it's very arbitrary, really. Yes, but I, I see that in all of your work, uh, as you progress through your, your career, it's, the, it's, the, it's that vision of Ireland which remains constant, because that is the geography of your psychology, your psyche, Absolutely. your spirit. Absolutely. It's imaged in, that, in those terms of, of the details, extraordinary details 
re recollected apparently perfectly from a, a perfectly remembered childhood. So like, like Joyce's recollection of Dublin, yours of Clare uh, is comparable. Oh. You, you find the images there that just give a presence to the feelings that you're expressing that makes your work so distinctive. So distinctively Irish as well as so distinctively artistic. You know. Yes, I think the childhood as we know for ever, anyone in this room or in the world, the childhood is the stamp. That stamps you, it's like branding an animal. For better and for worse, the entire sensibility, mm -hmm. your way of looking at things, your way of feeling, your religion or your revolt against your religion, mm -hmm. it's everything. Right. It's absolutely, and the history of the country, in this case Ireland, the geography, the right. rain, the climate, the melancholy, the daring, right. the singing, the this, the that, is all, I would say, it's in my bloodstream. Yes. And um, I don't, you know, it's strange. I don't, for instance, say coming on the train here, I don't think of images of Ireland. I think of Ireland, but in a general sense. When I'm writing, something happens that I suppose happens to writers, but it's a bit of a mystery. A bit of road or a, a bit of a, of a bed of nettles, let's say, with half of them lodged where they've just been cut and the smell, comes to you. It's like a, a visitation, this, this imagery. And I always um, thank God that I grew up in the country. I don't think, you see, there's nobody like Joyce which we'll come to in a minute. But I don't think if I'd been born in a city that I would have been able to pull together the myriad images of city, because right. they're much harder to do. Somehow, or maybe it is as well, that I love the country. Like last night here, the frost and trees and everything so spectral, yes. so beautiful, you know, mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. New York. And uh, Ireland is, is in my bones and in my brain, right. for which I'm, you know, they're always cross with me that I don't live there. But to me, I, actually, it's, it's uh, technicality. Right. I don't think it's right. any betrayal of a country right. not to live in it. Samuel Beckett didn't live in it. Joyce didn't live in it. Uh, but they still <coughs> wrote about no, it. They brought it's it with them. In they their, brought their it with them and brought it to the world. They brought it to the world, yeah. that's right, in a way that people who stayed there didn't. And I suppose that's one of the reasons you yourself had to leave. I, I'm oh, yes. I, continuously impressed with the way you wrote your first book. I, I hope our readers, our viewers, realize that Edna wrote her first book what, in three weeks yes. after you got off the, off the, the, boat. the train at Euston yeah. Station. You yes. rushed off and wrote yeah. this it wonderful wrote novel itself, in three actually. weeks. It oh. really wrote itself. It was the easiest book. I cried all the time writing mm. it. And I'd had two children. I, my children were born then. Mm. I was in my 20s. And I was writing this book. And they would put, because I got an advance for it. I got the noble sum of 50 pounds, $100 from I two publishers, what? which I spent immediately. <laughs> I bought domestic things, which I thought mm. would please the man I was married to. And I brought mm. my children some toys. Mm. So now I had to write the book. Mm. And I didn't know what I was going to write. Just began, I wakened quickly and sat up in bed abruptly. It is only when I'm anxious that I waken easily. For a minute, I could not remember what it was that worried me. Then I remembered the old reason he had not come home, my father. And in a sense, it sets the tone, I suppose, for all my writing. We all long for either a mother or a father or a motherland, or a fatherland. Regardless of what we have had, we long for the ideal one. Right. But when I was writing it, um, my children, who were about four and five at the time, used to put notes on, I wrote it in their bedroom, by the window, on a jotter. Uh, they used to put notes under the door, little blackmailing notes, like, we miss you, <laughs> we are lonely for you, <laughs> and all that. And it was... Um, it was so easy uh, to write because it was as if it had been lying in wait. Do you know, the first book is always the easiest, actually. Been, yeah. They get harder. And you have to discipline yourself more as you go along. Do you, or you, do you write books like that anymore? Or this do you book plan I've them? just finished, Time and Tide, took me three years. And I put See. the last, I did the last word at Farrow Strauss on 
on Thursday evening, I went down with the proofs, and in the taxi I'm changing, yes. changing, yes. and there was one word, I hope this doesn't bore you, I was trying to think, it's a rather distraught woman in this book, but there's lots of other things as well, but I was trying to think of, it's of, of what it is, that the word for the thought, if you're disturbed, the thought, and I was trying to think, you know, the fist of thought, I wanted a hard word, mm. the kernel of thought, and I suddenly, this lovely girl, Philida, brought in a whole lot of dictionaries. And I opened one at the word sediment. And it was the perfect Good word, fantastic. this sediment of thought. So that took me three years to do. They take longer. First mm. of all, it's a longer book. But also, the style, the style of the country girls was a very natural, simple, confessional style. That's right. Mm. But you have to advance from that. You have to, I still like lucidity in style, but I like complexity as well, because it's complexity that makes everything uh, good, do you right. know? Well, you certainly have. I mean, your, your subsequent novels, uh, I'm thinking especially of Night, is, is, is clearly a significant change, in a very much more lyrical and, and um, uh, I think in many ways more mature and powerful work than Less your earlier Less jokes, work. alas. Less <laughs> jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Great, so, yes. My children always yeah. say to me, because mm. in life I think, or they think that I'm sort of funny, or mm. can be, when they call me Becky, they always say, Becky, why when you put pen to paper <laughs> does this terrible gloom take yes. over? <clears throat> well, in, in your early books you had the two, the two, the two girls, yes, that uh, yes. were two sides of yourself, I, I, I imagine, and you're, you're, you're uh, extroverted and your introverted side, and they play against one another beautifully. Yes. Of course, that, that's a wonderful way to deal with with the conflicts yourself must have felt yes, yes. Uh, oh. with what you felt would be people would perceive as a betrayal of loyalties yeah and the the struggle between the two sides of yourself to yes. be true and to be uh, to what you grew to up with. To be rebellious and to be docile. To, be, at the same to time. be a nice daughter and to say, listen, That's this right. is a nightmare. That's right. Now I yeah. say, if I feel it's a nightmare, mm -hmm. I say it's a nightmare. Because that's, right. yeah. that's very important. Because mm -hmm. I think uh, fiction, great fiction, like Proust is a great example, and indeed Joyce yes. uh, is a great example, although Joyce's principal thing is his, his language more than his psychology. It but is. great writing, Tolstoy, yeah. I mean, the psych psychological delving in Tolstoy and Chekhov. And I think when I read a book that I love, it meets many of my needs. It meets needs on many of many levels. And indeed, one of them is psychological, mm -hmm. of how people are with people, of compassion, mm -hmm. of rage, of obstacle. I mean, it's all, it's mm -hmm. all part of it. I would like you, before we go, our time is beginning to run out, Edna, to read a few sentences or a paragraph from one of your books. Sure. Because you read so time? wonderfully. Short, we many? have five minutes. Five minutes. So if you could read. I thought we were going to talk about take. James Joyce. Well, we it have didn't. the choice. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we would love to hear you read, because you read so, your own work so wonderfully. You know the great uh, line I love in Ulysses, I love it all, and I will read then. The great line is Leopold Bloom in this pub, writing to Martha Clifford, and aloud to himself, he says, to his dead son, he says, love, hate, these are words, Rudy, soon I am old. Yes. Now, time-wise, I wonder if I should only read half a page. Read a little bit. Uh, a little bit less than we thought. Yes. Okay. Midnight, the great clock in the hall struck. The pauses between the chimes are naturally long. Then the dog barked outside, a whole series of yelps growing fiercer, fiercer, reaching a frothing crescendo, and then suddenly stopping as if overwhelmed. This dog, Tara, had never been known to be silenced by any but its master. Were a stranger now entering, the dog, even on its fetters, would be ungovernable. It must be its master. Who else could it be? It would be awfully inconvenient now if it was him said Betty, his wife, loudly, the knife still poised in the birthday cake, the icing beginning to shed from the impact of the blade. And yet, everyone hoped that it was him, John. The wandering Odysseus returned home in search of his Penelope. You could feel the longing in the room. You could touch it. A hundred lantern slides ran through their minds. Their longing united them, each rendered innocent by this moment of supreme suspense. It seemed that if the wishes of one were granted, 
then the wishes of all others would be fulfilled in rapid, merry succession. It was like a spell. Miss Lawless felt it too, felt prey to a surge of happiness, what with Abelard watching her with his lowered eyes, his long fawn eyelashes, soft and sleek as a camel's. Yes, it was as if life were just beginning, tender, spectacular, all-embracing life, and she, she like everyone else, were jumping up to catch it, catch it. Mm, lovely. Uh, Colleen, thank um, you. Joyce is your, we have a minute or two, and I would want to, to leave here without asking you about the figure who enables, I think, every Irish fiction writer, including yourself, yes. uh, James Joyce. Well, he's a mountain, he's a tabernacle, he's a mountain, he's a cave, he's a woman, he's a man, he's a child, he's a genius. And what he did and the, uh, the pain and trial he caused to his own psyche, what he did has no match. He sent himself into vertigo, as you know, and escalations of language for which he got very little reward. Mm. I mean, because to make that journey he made, as he said himself when he came down into the room where his wife and children were, he said, I have come back from the Azores. Mm. I love Joyce, I love him as a man, I love him as a writer, and I think our debt to him, whether we're Irish or not, but it affects us more when we're Irish because it's wonderful to have had such a, a godhead. Right. He is a model, both, <coughs> excuse me, he's a model in, in every respect, I think, as a, giving us uh, not only his command of language, his, his, his uh, commitment to the, yes. oh, the artistic totally. vocation. Oh, to excruciating. His honesty. He crucified himself. Yes. His, his courage, mm. his faith in his own yeah. powers. And his belief in his own powers. Yeah. So this is something that I see yeah. in you, too. I have, throughout. because it's God-given. It, it is. It's, it's not an ego like trip, you see. Some writers, I think, e ego trip. Sure, it's nice if someone says, I like your mm -hmm. book, but in the moment and duration of creation, whether it's an <coughs> hour or a month, mm -hmm. it's like being visited. And yes. he knew that, he went out into the, but it's still very, where it's hardest, actually, is combining it with what is laughingly called ordinary life. Because right. you're longing to meet someone on that level and in that place, and ordinary life isn't like that. It can't be. Mm -hmm. So I would think Joyce was excruciatingly lonely as well, although he loved, you know, his wife Nora Barnacle and adored yeah. his children. The, 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 the icebergs and crags of his mind yeah. would meet no mate. They right. couldn't. They couldn't. Mm -hmm. So that his courage and his everything... One yeah. of the things that surprises me about him, he was quite shameless about accepting money. He was very mm -hmm. tough about money and felt people should give him money. Mm -hmm. But there's a lovely story. I was in Zurich and I went to his grave, but I met an old woman, by now old woman, a waitress who knew him. She yes. said he was the most generous man with tips. So <laughs> he took the money from that's the rich. Right. He did, yes. And <laughs> he gave, gave it to, the, right. to those who needed yeah. it. Well, Edna, I'm sorry to see that our time is almost gone. I'm delighted to have this chance to chat with you. And I'm afraid we'll have to end it here. But on behalf of all of us here, I'd like to thank you for coming today to talk to us. Thank you. You had a hard job. God bless you. <laughs> Thanks, Connie. Among Edna O'Brien's many books are The Country Girls Trilogy, A Fanatic Heart, Night, The High Road, Lantern Slides, and Tales for the Telling. These books are available from Ferrara, Strauss, and Giroux and Penguin Books.